uh, chapter 30, this is when, chapter 30, when Hashem says to Moshe, <coughs> go and tell them. Go and tell them the four expressions of redemption. In this particular text, it's on page Kuf Yutches. It's towards the, um, towards the end of the chapter. Page Perik Lament Shloshim. Elo Arba Lashonos Shalgula. These four expressions of redemption. What are the four expressions of redemption? Vote Sesi. I will take them out. The Tzalti, I will save them. I will extricate them. The Tzalti Eschem, Me'avodosam. I will excrete you from their work. Ugo'alti Eschem, I will redeem you. Ugo'akachti Eschem, Lilom. And I will take you to be my people. It's interesting, you know. The Amido is divided in three parts. The first section, first three brachos are referred to as ovos. We speak about El Avrom, the patriarchs. The middle blessings are requests. And the closing blessings are giving thanks. So the thanks blessing begins. Modi menachnu loch. Shatu Hashem elokeinu. We give thanks to you that you are our God. Surchayenu, Mogen Yeshenu, you're the rock of our life, you're the protector, you're the shield. And then we speak about the miracles that he performs on our behalf and the goodness that he does for us. But what's the first and foremost? The first thanks. We thank you that you are our God. We have, do you know what it means? God, the creator, the infinite being, he took us to be his people. Lokach, Hashem, Lokach, It's not a. Of course, he's the master of everything. Of course, all you matter, everything are his subjects, are his creation. But you'll be my people. Shatohu Hashem Elokeinu. God took us, we should be exclusively his. And we have this special relationship. This is. You understand? You understand what Moshe is telling them? Ultimately, where does it culminate? It starts in Egypt. To excrete you at various levels from the bondage. But Goalti, Goalti is when the sea closed on the Egyptians. Now you're free of your enemies. You don't have to worry about them any longer. When they were cast on the shore, on the seashore, you saw their remains. Now we go to Sinai. What's Sinai? This is the ultimate. This is something which is unheard of. The infinite, unlimited Almighty takes us, we're fickle, nothing. Nothing. We're special to him. We're his people. This is what it is. You know, it's something not, not, to, not to be imagined. It's like Lahabdil Elif Abdolos. The greatest head of a corporation takes you to be his private advisor. Unlimited benefits, financial perks, whatever it is. No worry, care. And he has the ability to take care of every conceivable need that you ever have. And any request. On, this is on a moral level. The person couldn't stop singing God's praises. So if God himself says, I will be that, how much more do we have to sing his praises? How ecstatic do we have to be? And he gives us the means. How do we become his people? He gave us his Torah. You be my people, and then therefore, how do we interact? How do we have relevance to one another? How do we spiritualize ourselves? That's the Torah itself. We have the four cups of wine. The Seder, Moshe Zayel, come on, as will be explained. What was the original? Why did we originally go to Egypt? Because the, the comment between the parts, 
where Hashem had said, Tavrom Avinu, Yodoa Teda, Ki Ger Yezaracho. Your children will be strangers. Ba'avodum, they will be enslaved. The Inuosam, they will be afflicted. So three things. Ger, they'll be strangers. They'll be enslaved, is two. Inuosam, three. Ba'akein, Ba'akein Yetzir B'chush Godel. And then they will go out with great wealth. It's interesting. There's a famous word from the Dubna Magid. The Magid of Dubna, he was a student of the Dubna Gon, where he was able to explain everything with an allegory. At a level, with such a level of clarity and understanding, it was unusual. And he goes to explain, there's a midget that says, when the Achrei Chaim Yetzir B'chush Godel, then they will go out with great wealth, is referring to Kabbalah Satora. Giving of Torah Sina, that is the great wealth. But we read in Torah differently. Daber no Bosneom, plead with the people, they should borrow the personal precious, personal effects from the Egyptians, the silver, the gold, vessels, that. So Shaliyom or Satzadik, that Avramavidu shouldn't say. The first part of the promise was the decree happened, but the, it never culminated. You go out with great wealth. Therefore, please borrow. Tell the people they must borrow the silver and gold vessels, the gold, silver vessels, and the garments. So how do we reconcile the Midrash with the Pasuk? He explains it with a, with a marshal, with an allegory. He says, <coughs> there was this young man who was illiterate, and his father had a person who had a, a lumber business. And he says to his friend, you know, my son's off for the summer. Maybe get hired him for three months. Okay? He's so more than happy to work from dusk to dawn. And you pay him at the end of the season. The boy's there every morning, works dusk to dawn, never misses a day. After three months out, he writes him a check, $5,000, which is an enormous amount of money for a 16 year old boy. The boy comes home, the boy's depressed. So the father says, he's sulking. So the father says to the son, why are you sulking? He says, you realize I worked myself to the bone. I was dedicated, I sacrificed for this man. After three months, he gives me a piece of paper with some scribbling on it. What kind of compensation is this? He said, of course, the father understood. But his son really can't, he's not able to read, doesn't understand the value of it. So he calls up his friend, he says, do me a favor, take a few silver shiny coins put it in a bag, would they jingle? Give it to my son, you'll make him the happiest person in the world. Is there a comparison between a $5,000 check and a few silver coins? No comparison. But what does he understand? He's immature, he's illiterate, doesn't have the capacity even to grasp the value of what he was given. So the Dubna Magad says, when we left Egypt, at what level were we? You're going to get the ultimate in spirituality. We didn't even have uh, the capacity to process what that meant. Every day we were out of Egypt, we advanced another level until we reached the ultimate level. At Sinai, we understood the value of the material and the value of the spiritual. So initially, what was the Ruchush Godel? Ruchush Godel, at that level, was the wealth, the material wealth. But afterwards, we realized when we grew, what was the true wealth? The true wealth was the relationship with Hashem, which is only through the Torah. That's the Dubna Magid. This Vokachti Eschem Lilom. This is the fourth Expression of redemption. This is Ein Lucha Ben Chorin. Why is that redemption? Ein Lucha Ben Chorin Lishos Torah. Because that's when you're truly free of all the inhibitions and all the worries. Everything. This is Lokach De Eschem Liyom. That's the fourth expression of redemption. So we have four parts. Geri Azir Azaracho. Your children will be strangers. Bavodum. They will be enslaved. They will be afflicted, and they will go out with great wealth. Birzeh, Kiyoshloshet Dvorim, Tchilo. First, at the level of bondage, there were three stages. Gerus, we were strangers. Avagav she'einu meshubad. Laacher, mitzachu ger, einu koach kemaratoshev. A person who's an alien, he doesn't have the rights of a citizen. So... Immediately, you're ready, you're positioned, you're compromised. You're in a compromised state. At, at, what, at your goodwill, I'm here. 
that I have no independent rights. What was the next stage? Then it was bondage. The terrorist from Shabnevet, they enslaved us. Like you enslaved what? A slave. We became slaves. And then it went from bad to worse. Then it intensified. We had affliction. We were afflicted through the slavery. Meaning when you overtax a slave, if you work, the responsibility is more than a slave. That's called affliction. That's called abuse. Can't abuse, but they abused us. As it says, it was Avod as Perech. What's Perech? Perech. Rashi says, it, it, it made the body brittle. It broke us. Physically, we were broken. So we have first the three stages of bondage. Leading. Ger, Abdus, Avodum, Inu. So when he comes to redeem us, so we peel away the layers. We go take, we, we pull it back. So what do you start from? Inui. We take away the, the affliction. Then you have bondage. You take away the, uh, bo the, the slavery that you're working. And then we stop the work, but still, you're still aliens in the land. You're still there. You're, you're in, on foreign soil. Hizchel ba'achron min inui. Shurakoshe umenu hutsim tchilo. Started from the bad to better, from worse to better. So first, the affliction ceased, but we still had chores. Then there were no longer chores, but we were still there. We were strangers in the land. I will take you out from under the suffering. What suffering? That's inuy. That's the work which is beyond human capacity. That I will, that will cease to be. You're going to be extricated from their work. So that means even regular servitude you're not going to have any longer. No worse than a regular slave. You'll be extricated from their work. You're not going to be, they can't dictate your life whatsoever. You're going to be redeemed from the midst. We left Egypt, we redeemed from them. And when was it forever God, good riddance? When the sea closed on them, they were destroyed. Even though you were independent, you no longer had masters. But, so where are you today? You're nowhere. You're nowhere in your lives. You're ex-slaves. Without that master, you're no longer afflicted. But what's your intrinsic value? They have to enter into God's domain. We're not like other nations. Other nations are what? They're subject to all their desires, their inhibitions, and everything, whatever goes along with that. There's a Different. There's going to be a special relationship. There's going to be a cleaving, an attachment. There's going to be a spiritualization. All other nations, they're physical people. Due to this relationship, it's like you take something and you put into an energy source. It begins glowing. You become animated. It's a different function. You ascend to another level. So that's the four. The four correspond, the four expressions of Gula respond, correspond to the Ger, Yezer, Zaracho, the four levels. Both Pirish, another understanding. Four things it says. Geri Yasaracho, Avodum, Vinim Osam. Okay? And then they will have great wealth. Fisho Yisrub, Mitzrayim, Roy, Shimashubodim, in Mitzrayim. I said earlier, why was Egypt the location of bondage? 
he said, because they were the, a nation that was totally devoid of spirituality. The Jews at that point, what was their origin? They had no origin. They had no land. You're, you're a Canaanite. You came from Canaan. You're an African. You came from Africa. Wherever you came from, you came from somewhere. You identify with a land. The Jews had no land. There are people without a land. So therefore, you're enslaved to the Egyptians. It's like a slave that's born in the household of his master. We were born in the we were born into slavery. Because we had no there was no previous existence before Egypt as a people. Yaakov went down with seventy people, it was a family. So where did we become a people? We were born into a people in slavery. We were born in the household of the Egyptians. I will remove you from under the Sivlos, the suffering of Egypt. You're born here, you have all the responsibilities. We dictate to you. You were born into slavery. And it was forced upon them. They forced, they demanded. As it says, they, they appointed taskmasters. They set quotas. And they demanded the work. They enslaved them with what? Forcibly. Pa with power. I will save you. Some of these being beaten up, being attacked. And you save that person. What are you saving them from? From the clutches of, that, of the attacker. He's being victimized. I will save you. With that powerful hand. I will save you from the hand. Even though you're not slaves, but you're not free to do what you want, they couldn't leave. Sharei, Himu Shusacherim, Elgalti Eschem, Badain Afagav Shinigaluk, even though they were redeemed, Ainlem Hamal Yosem Lam Hashem, but you're not yet fit to be God's people. Fichachom El Kaf Eschem Lilom. Come and Herachni Yosef Zev Shabbat Hakol B'Vodir. He'll explain everything. But again, see, nobody ever thinks. What is the fourth expression of Gula? The first thing, if Goalti is the third, the Goalti Eschem. So we're no longer we're redeemed. So why is the fourth Makachti Eschem Lilom? Why is that a, an expression of Gula? Redemption. We are because we're redeemed from our physicality. The only way we could actually be a different reality have no relevance or semblance to what we originally were, it's only I will take you to be my people. That's the fourth, and therefore it's an expression of Gula. Elu Roshi Bisavosam. These are the heads of the families, the pedigree of the tribes. So Rashi says it starts with Ruvain. What do we have to speak about the pedigree of Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi? Because ultimately we want to arrive to speak about Moshe and Aaron, to speak about their pedigree. You know, they came from special parents, parentage. Amram, Yocheved, special. Kohos was his grandfather. It's famous, there's an uh, interesting um, Sifarno, the Sifarno says we find <coughs> that the only tribe that did not succumb to the Chet Egel was Levi. Why? So he says because Levi was the last of the brothers to pass away. So therefore he had to do, he lived the longest, so he raised even his grandchildren or great-grandchildren. 
So he had the greatest influence on them. The others, because the others, their grandparents passed away earlier, so they had l less influence. So they were affected to a greater degree from the culture, the Egyptian culture. But Levi, because he lived longer, he watched over his grandchildren. Therefore, because of that extra tutelage and effusion of, 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 of influence, that's why his children, his grandchildren, and the tribe did not succumb to idolatry. That's a Sephardo. But why do we begin tracing the pedigree of Moshe and Aaron? We start with Ruvain. Hischel Asabi Yechusami Ruvain. Klomashi Yotsumi Shevet Levi. Shlishi Lishvotim. How do we know Levi's the third? You say, there's one and two. Levi's the third. See, Rashi just cites the measures. Why do we start with Ruvain? We're starting with Ruvain because we want to arrive at Moshe and Aaron at Levi. But Moshe and Aaron is, is the focus. So let's discuss it. Why can't we just start right away? Let's talk about Moshe and Aaron. Levi, Kos, Amram, Moshe and Aaron. Why do we have to start two tribes before and mention who their families were? So he says, because we want to emphasize the third. Being the third is something special. Third, why? Kloma, Shiyotsu, Mishabit Levi. They were descended from the tribe of Levi, which is the third of the tribes, the third one of the sons. The third always has a greater capacity to achieve perfection. Because to explain, because that's a more complete number. Why is it more complete? One is one. So we speak about. Abundance. One has no relevance to abundance. Benu nikra mispar. Now, mispar means counted. You see one. You don't have to count one. One is one. You have two. It's one, two. So that's counting. They're ready. When you have two, you have to count. Okay? Umisbishnaim in a misbisholim. But two is not a complete why. Kaimbo rag zug veimbo nifrad. Because it's a pair. Two is a pair. So two is really has relevance to one. Right? A pair. A person that has a pair of shoes. A pair of shoes is made up of two. But it's a pair. Right? So two, three is comprised of two plus a third. Okay? The Yeshbo Nifra, Nikra Zem It includes everything. It's the pair plus one. It's mispar, because the, the pair is one, two, counting. Then it has the additional, as they say in the vernacular, three's a crowd. Two's company, three's a crowd. The third one is, you know, that's the odd man out. Right? So that's three. That's why it's mispar sholi. Abavosha shlishu mispar sholi. I mean, fine, that's true, right? Yaakov was the third of the patriarchs. He was the most special of the patriarchs. The third is always the most special. The third always has a greater capacity to achieve perfection. Therefore, Levi was chosen to be the tribe that the redeemers should descend from that tribe. Moshe and Aaron. Because since the third tribe has a greater capacity to achieve perfection, Ben Kamagoni says you can speak a lot about this, but he says this is not the place for it. The specialness of three, of being the third. Now, Amram married normally before Sinai for a, for a, for a Noahite, a Ben Noah, a nephew is permitted to marry an aunt. It's not considered incestuous, but for a Jew, it's, an in, it's considered incest. But since it was before Sinai, so we were Noahites, it was permitted. But, but still, the Jews kept the Torah before it was given at Sinai. Unless it was necessary, there's an overriding factor. Because in essence, it's not incest. Because our classification was Noahites. Okay? He says, It was important the father and mother should be from the tribe that was chosen that the Goalim should descend from that tribe. Because 
Tainu Kaos. Right? It was Levi. Kos. Kos was the first generation. Levi is, is the patriarch of Levi. Levi. Kos. Umne Kos. Who's the Bukhar of Kos? So Kos is Levi's one. Kos is two. And now Kos being the firstborn. Who's the firstborn of, Am of Kos? Amram. Okay? Ne Kos Harishon Hu Amram. Umne Amram Hashlishi. So Amram. Ne Kos Harishon Hu Amram. Umne Amram Hashlishi. Miriam Aaron of Moshe. Yeah, who's the last? There's Moshe, Aaron. Ah, Moshe, Moshe's number three. So of the three of the most special, he the, has the greatest capacity. Shleimus, because that's Mispar Sholim. Yishba Achon El Kabos HaShleim. Mitzad, she's a Mispar, who Mispar Sholim. Kashlohoyo kan shum hachono. Asroch Mispar Sholim, they shagi HaShleimus. You can take something with various levels of preparation to bring it to a more complete state. But Moshe was complete when he was born. Because, he, because it, there was no preparation to bring that about. Therefore, he's three. Kabbalah Satoru was when? Third month. Right? Nisan, Niyor, Sivan. Sivan. It's again, it's the third month. Everything is three. The Hainu Shvar Nolad Levi, Shemuchan Lios Yotsi Mimenu Gwali. He's the third. He's the most perfect. Because he's the third son. The golem are meant to come from him. Oz ain't sir hachona gemura misper sholin megamri. Avlo yachon also be shnaim milavad. Shab shnaim yishbuk tzas misper. Which is bar lemalo shein misper zuk. Hach ben levi hasheni shukos muhan lotzitz menogolim. So levi is number three. And the, what's the misper? Two. Two, two is what? The second generation is what? Is Kos. Kos is two. Start Levi, Kos is the second generation. So that's two. But two, we said it before, is not misparasholing. That doesn't make a difference. But because it emanated from a misparasholing. Of course, Levi, even though we use one, but he's the third. Kikol she'ev she'lahagdim ha'tov shu'agulo hu'magdi. Ba'akach shosef ba'achono. Kikos sho yesheni gambo hachono. Kamo shemar lamalo kach lo hoyo. Tzorch ot kval legamri hachono. Menolet berishon. Es asheroi lotz min algolim. He was the first one to be born. Va amrom hoyo rishon. Kasher nodu algolim baatzmom. Now, so the golden were born from the first from the bechor. Amram was a bechor. That's the reason why, that's what Korach said. Why do they take two positions? Moshe, the leader, Aaron, the Kohen Godel, because his father was a Bukhar. Bukhar takes two portions. He, Korach, claimed, I should get the third appointment. Ship. So why do they skip over me to choose El Ditzov Menuzil to be the head of the Shevet? Evidently, it's not so simple. It's based on qualification. I'm more qualified than Moshe, I mean. Definitely more than Aaron. They are, the, they are the fathers of the redeemers. Therefore we speak, we have to point out, we could speak about, about Moshe, but no, but the Torah starts the line of pedigree from the beginning. So how do we focus on the third Levi being the third, and Moshe being the third, you have to see the full picture. The Torah is giving us the, uh, how, it, how it's evolving. The involvement of the redeemers. There's nothing which is coincidental. Coincidentally, Levi was the third. Ar Amram was the Bechor. He had three children. And Moshe happened to be the third. There's no coincidences. The Gula is such a monumentous moment. It's so fundamental to 
the meeting the objective of existence. This is just random. It's not possible. God set it in a, in a very specific order to achieve what has to be achieved. Koshkim said, Yishtaushlus. Rak hakol api Hashem. Many things contained with this, this discussion, which are profound, which are deep. There's nothing more. He doesn't want to discuss it more here. The person has a, a sophisticated piece of equipment that they use in an operating room. Sophisticated beyond and of course endless amounts of money and the level of technology. See, how did this all come about? It just happened. Big bang. <laughs> they said, what are you talking about? It's big bang. What does it cost so much? <laughs> right? And you have to study how to use it and, and, and you have to be trained and this takes th three years. This came about just by itself. This is random. This world is random. And to achieve its perfection is random. And the person qualified to, to facilitate that, that's also random. You know, you say to people, when were you born? What do you know about life? The person built a, a business, took him 70 years to build it. Iron clad business. Everything was addressed and attended to. The person comes along and goes, it's not a big deal. The man can't sign his name, not a big deal. What do you understand what, what it takes to build a business? Well, you've got to be lucky. That, that, that's, what, that's what the people say. You've got to be lucky. I mean, the man's talking like a fool. So to talk about creation, about purpose of creation, objective of creation, being qualified to facilitate that, this is all random. Nothing less than Al-Pi Hashem. It's orchestrated and dictated and detailed. Hashem's personal involvement, every step of the way. It's always to go back to this. You can't. The person believes in God, believes God created the world, everything under the sun. Rabbi, but why do I have to keep kosher? I can't understand it. Does it really make a difference whether you understand it or not? We're talking about God said. Do you agree God said? You don't need more than that. Why did God create volcanoes? Why are there earthquakes? Why is there this? Did God consult with you? Just your reality of life. God says as a Jew, your reality is you have to keep kosher. What's kosher? What he dictates is kosher. Why? It's irrelevant why. But that's what you have to do. It doesn't make sense to me. It's irrelevant what it makes sense to you. You're irrelevant. And he actually slay Pharaoh. Now we get to this whole discussion we're do dealing with now in the, part, in, the, in, the, in the weekly reading. Hashem says, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh. It's an obvious question. What about free choice? Right. The man has no free choice. His, his, his accomplishment has no value. And why is he held culpable? Right? And he actually slay Pharaoh. Yesh makshim loma hakodesh borchu. Loma hirba hakodesh borchu hamakos al Pharaoh. Why did God bring so many multiple plagues upon Paro? Uman Rabos, Mosa, bears from Troyim? Because he wanted to increase all the signs, the miracles, the wonders, the wonders in Egypt. Mashi wrote to Paro Lishboa. So Moshe, Paro wanted to see, is it witchcraft is it, or is it God? Loma Noigimo, Kokach, Lachis, Libo, Achilu Lishboa. God says, Vance, I'm going to create a blockage. That he will not see. He will not heed my word. He won't see the truth. Take an innocent man, you're beating him. You cover his eyes, he can't see light. Say, but why don't you see light? You put a blindfold on me, how am I supposed to see the light? Well, you didn't heed my word. I didn't have a choice. I didn't have the ability. You said up front, I will harden his heart. He says, the question doesn't begin. Again, like we say, you have a question, there's an answer. Sometimes the question is, not a, is a baseless question. He says, Ein zekashi shal kum. This question is, has no merit, no basis, it's nothing. 
Yivnei Shem Paro, Mi Hashem Hashem Mekolo. Moshe presents himself, presents his credentials, performs miracles. He says, Mi Hashem Hashem Mekolo. Here is the level of arrogance. HaRosh HaZeh, Vamo HaGorm Shloil Noda Shmo Hashem. Why was God not known in existence? Paro was the height of civilization. He deified himself. Do you think Paro wanted God to be known in existence? He's the cause. He's the cause. He's the one who's suppressing God's existence. He's concealing it. He doesn't want to know about it. Because if there's a God, what, 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 who are you? You're the deity. Deified himself. Kakol Yodu. Akfiro. Everybody was aware of the rejection of the concept of monotheism. So who was the cause of Chil Hashem? Who desecrated God's name? He's saying like this, phenomenal. I always said, today it doesn't, won't have the same impact, but at one time where the world was had a religious conscience, persona or profile and the Pope would come out and say I'm converting to Judaism the Jewish people are the chosen nation all that we've ever done was we were worshipping falsehood and we have to repent for all the pain and suffering brought upon Jewish people and so on and we have to serve the Jew because they're the chosen people could you imagine the Pope saying this publicly internationally broadcasting this you know, what, you know what can kid So the one who was Mechal Hashem, the one who says, you can't be the chosen people. He says, no, you are. Egypt, who were the, the height of civilization, the height of paganism, the man who's a deed himself, he goes, he's going to admit that God is the master. You who denied, you'll be the, be the one to admit it. You said, through you, God's going to become a known entity in, in the world. You know, in the vernacular, they say, you know, you can eat those words. Okay? But it's more than eating your words. I always said, even though it's, it's interesting, we find that Yisro is always referred to as Kohen Nijad. So what does the word Kohen mean? Literally, Kohen usually, usually means priest. But Rashi explains that the word Kohen can also mean Sheik. Sheik is, is a Kohen. It doesn't have to mean a religious figure. But if you learn it, it means, because as according to Chazal, why was his daughters driven away from the, when they were watering the sheep? Why? Because their father was excommunicated because he rejected idolatry. Because he worshipped every deity in the world, and his conclusion was it's all false. Monot the truth is only monotheism. See, he was actually, he was excommunicated. So therefore, the shepherds, they drove his daughters away. He's always referred to as Kohen Mijon. That Kohen means the priest. So I always ask the question. A person says that a convert, you shouldn't say anything which is pejorative about a non-Jew in his presence for gen ten generations. Because there's a certain sensitivity to that, and it can be painful. You touch a so certain raw nerve. It takes about ten generations for it to totally fade out. Here, the man converted to be a Jew. And we don't let the man to for forget. Kohen Mijon, Kohen Mijon, Kohen Mijon. There's a Torah violation. It's called Onaz Dvorim. You can't say anything that aggrieves a person. You're grieving him. But he's continuing called Kohen Midjon. You know what? But this is the Kiddush Hashem. That's a feather in his cap. Even though he's the Kohen Midjon, but what, what, what does he proclaim? It's not Mr. Nobody proclaims unity of God and the omnipotence of Hashem. This is the Kohen Midjon who says it. Despite being the Kohen Mijon, what does he believe? So therefore he's saying the same thing. Who's going to proclaim God's unity and Achtus Hashem in the, in the world? The one who denied it. The one who didn't allow it to be. I will harden his heart. And they will know. My meaning through them whether they admit it or not, but that will be the location where the world, looking at the location, will know on the Hashem. 
these are revealed miracles. Tachos Omer Mi Hashem 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 Bekolo. Ficho Chayev Paro Lesakin Mashakil Kol Kvar. Paro has to correct, rectify the damage that he brought upon existence. He was responsible that God was an unknown entity in existence. Achal Yodu Yednoda Shmo Yisborach Lekach Hikshu Libo Shlo Yishman Leman Yovi Olav Hashem Makos Hashem hardened his heart because, again, why was he culpable? He was culpable because of the past. He wasn't culpable for denying God continuously. God hardened his heart so the correction should come about there. Haksuvos Ozir Noda Shmo Yisborach Here we say we say the first five makos he had the, it says he hardened his own heart. It's only the last five. It says Hashem hardened his heart. So why is he liable? So the Rambam writes that he took away his power of choice. Hashem did it. And that's a punishment. But why should he be culpable? The answer is very simple. Why does he not have a power of choice? Because he chose not to have a power of choice. I'll give you an example I always give. A child has endless privileges and the child abuses the privileges, abuses the parent who gives the privileges. And the father says to the child, one more chance. You abuse me or the privilege one more time, I, I take away all privileges and I'll treat you like a stranger. And the, ch the child crosses the line. Father keeps his word. The child is disinherited disenfranchised. My father is a bad man. You see what he did to his son? Did he do it to his son or did he do it to himself? It was your choice not to have privileges. Because you were forewarned, you crossed the line one more time, you forfeit the privileges. So why does he not have privileges? Because you chose to forfeit it, to cross the line. Paro five times, five of the miracles, he had the ability to see it right. His arrogance, his insolence, his self centeredness He chose... I will turn my back on God. And he acted arrogantly. Shem says, okay. Now you're going to pay the price. So now that he has no choice, but why does he not have choice? Because you abused it. You abused the privilege of free choice. You abused it enough, Hashem says, but now when you do the wrong thing, when you have no, 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 no ability, you're held culpable. Because then why now don't you have, have the ability? Because you chose not to have the ability. So he says, the second thing he's going to say what I just said. He says, there's another reason why the question doesn't even begin. Another reason. First five plagues, God didn't harden his heart. He chose to harden his heart. Only the last five plagues. The first five had to do with the terrestrial level. The last five had to do with the atmosphere and celestial. When the plagues were on the terrestrial level. Dams for their kinim. Right? Adam who rose at Achtonim, who controls the terrestrial level. Hashem gave, right, the ability. He is the dominant figure on the earthly level. Atu min elyonim gamke, but he also has a certain godliness besides dictating the terrestrial level. Chen lo yamakos govim olav yosem yasher ho yikoch shel Adam. He's saying something interesting. Paro had the ability to suppress, to exercise free choice, because how did the Marcus manifest themselves? In the physical. God gave him the ability, you dominate the physical. 
so if you dominate fiscal, that's, that, that's your playing field. You dictate that. So you dictate, you choose to do, you choose not to do. What about something which is, has to do with heaven? You would never, that, you don't, that you don't have choice. That's not your playing field. The only anything which come, which is outside of the realm of the material, the physical, he would have sent us out not because he's truly doing tshuva. He recognizes his wrong. Because they're overwhelming. So if he would have sent, sent us out, what would have been the value? It would have been an indication he repented. He didn't repent. It's beyond. It's like you take a person and you torture him, and he says yes. That's from his own volition. He's saying yes. The pain is so all-consuming. He has no choice but to say yes. He'd say yes in his sleep. So that means God is forcing you. If God would bring those plagues and he doesn't take away power of choice, what is he doing? He's forcing you to do something. It's to force you to send out the Jews. Here. Because it was beyond his power, send him out, he would have been forced to send him out. Of course, it's beyond his, uh, his capacity. So Hashem has to intervene to give him the strength not to succumb to something that's beyond his power. So what it seems to be, it's really his choice. This is similar to one of the explanations of the Ramban and the Sepharno. He couldn't have dealt beyond the fifth marker differently than he's saying. Hashem didn't want him to send him out because he's succumbing. He's strengthening him to put things back in balance. Anything comes from above is beyond your capacity. So, but you understand, but you, you don't, you're not really sending him out. God is sending him out. So God is hardening his heart to put things back in the balance. But why aren't you sending him out now? Of course, now this is, you're not sending him out. It's not because God took away your free choice. If he wouldn't have hardened his heart, he would, have, he would have been overwhelmed. He would have had to send him out. But that's not you sending him out. So again, God gives you the inner strength to stand up to it. So now you're in a balance. Now why aren't you sending him out? Because I'm cho choosing not to send him out. That's the Sephardim. That's one, one interpretation of Ramban. This week's parsha. Shem says, I, to Moshe, I've hardened this heart. This is before Arbe. Right? Before the locust. This is a basis for the heretics to say, God didn't allow him to do tshuva. Shenema, anich bari es libo. They have a basis to say, God doesn't treat the people fairly. The heretics, you see, see the way God treats people. He doesn't allow them to do tshuva, then he punishes them. Omer Ishlokish, Sir Ishlokish says to his Rebbe, Riyochad, Yisosei P.M. Shalminim. We should seal the mouths of the heretics. There's no basis for what they're saying. Eleim l'leitzim huyolitz. How do you treat scoffers, deprecators? You treat them like... Let them believe what they want. Let them believe what they want. Before God punishes a person, He gives him a number of warnings. Once, twice. You know, God could only fool you, warn you so many times. You know, once, twice, three times, then you pull the trigger. But before you pull the trigger, why don't you tell me you're pulling the trigger? I, I told you I was going to pull it. If you don't bathe yourself. 
they lefrobi menu mashachotu. So when he took away the free choice, this is the Rambam, real, it's medrash. It's pep. the reason why he had no choice is because he sinned. That's why he forfeited the, his choice because he was you were warned sufficiently. Afkamparu Rosha came shushaga lo akadosh baruch hu hate pomim lo shkiach alze. He he sent him five revealed miracles. And he didn't pay attention. Paro, Omar Kodesh Baruch Hu, Atok Shem Or Bacho, you acted stiff with a stiff neck against me. Now to Jose Baruch, and you're not willing to change. Harini Moshe Baruch Tumor Al Tumosoch. I'm going to add. I'm going to put you in a position that you're not going to have a choice. You're going to be addicted to it. Have a Omer Kedi Ifaris Libo Slave Avodov. To be continued.